Hi, welcome everyone, welcome to week 9. Um, today we are going to be talking about um, a couple of couple of, like pretty straightforward topics. Honestly, there's not a ton to get through this week, which is good. Um, same for next week, so the next two weeks are very light on the lectures. We've pretty much done the bulk of the coding that we're going to do in the course, which is good news as well. Um, but today we're going to talk about <coughs> software complexity and software safety. Um, the first thing I wanted to flag though is just a couple of admin things um, for everyone. First one is um, there's been the occasional person posting on the forum or emailing the tutors being like um, <coughs> being like my front end doesn't work um, blah 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 like blah 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 and it's like I think just something I really want to reiterate with the front end is that if your front end doesn't work it's because your code's broken. Now, I don't mean that in like a, you know, the ha-ha kind of way, but it's like um, you all write PyTest, right? And when we run your code for your project, nearly all of you pass your PyTest, right? You fail ours, but you nearly all the time you pass your own tests. Often when you fail our tests but pass your tests, it's because you wrote bad tests. You wrote tests that were missing something or you wrote tests that haven't been interpreted correctly through the spec and when you um when you run your front end if your front end is having lots of errors usually basically is saying that you're also going to lose a lot of marks well, not a lot of marks you may potentially lose a lot of marks on your um when we run our tests right basically your back end doesn't work it doesn't comply to the spec so um we'll help you out <coughs> you can post on the forum and stuff um, but if you're ever in the mindset where you're like, my, my back end works, but it's not working with the front end, that doesn't really make sense. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, if you run into major front end problems, you got to start thinking like, you know, why is this going wrong? And, is, and um, maybe I can show you at the end, but uh, typically, if you're loading up your front end, I can just show you on this web page here. Um, if your front end's having issues, there are two places you should look, right? Um, if you press F12 on your web on your keyboard or you right click on your browser and you hit inspect, there are two little tabs on this little <coughs> panel here that you want to look at. One is console, one is network. Um, if you do have problems with the front end that you can't figure out, generally if you just share your console tab and your network tab on the forum, um, that'll help us direct you in the right place because typically, typically, the network tab is going to help a lot because the network tab shows you what backend routes the front end has attempted to call. And generally speaking, and I'll just reiterate this now, <coughs> the easy ones to debug are when your backend returns like 500s, 404s, 405s, 400s. Um, because that says like something's gone wrong, right? Like that's a standard thing you could test with. The harder one, which some of you get caught up on, are when the backend returns a 200 success error. Everything went fine, but the most common problem is that students are returning the wrong data, like the wrong data structure. Like, you know, it meant, maybe it's meant to be a dictionary of lists, but you're returning a dictionary, a dictionary of lists, or just lists or something. So, um, that's the place to look. So if you get, if your routes are returning 200, right? If you see like a couple of routes here appearing, like I'll just show you what they look like. Like if you see some of your routes here appearing and they're 200, they're the ones you should look at, right? So this network tab is your eyes and ears into what's happening between the two, your, the front end we give you and your back end. And that's where, what can help you dig a little deeper. Um, great. Um, what was the other thing? Um, auto marking, as we said, uh, as I said in the notice on Saturday, um, those results should be coming out tonight. Um, I hope. If they're not, they're coming out tomorrow. But I'll update the page with more information. Um, it's just marking 700 students worth of complex backends um, is really <laughs> difficult. There's a lot of problems we've run into around that because um, we're basically we're we're starting up Flask servers like nothing else like you would you wouldn't even imagine so um there's some real infrastructural problems that we're running into and some tutors and me are working on it um we want to get it out before you tute this week so you have a chance to like potentially 
look at it and stuff. Um, but if it comes out later, it's not going to kill you. It's just, um, you know, <coughs> would just be good. And what was the third thing I wanted to say? I can't even remember. Okay. <coughs> Sorry for my coughs. I know it maxes out the mic a little bit. I'll try not to cough too loud. Um, I'm feeling mostly better, by the way. I just throat. Okay, so let's get into today. 9.1. Software. Um, complexity. Oh, just, yeah, just to be clear, sorry, before we get into it. So, can and I'd prefer we don't lose marks from iteration 2, content and iteration 3. You will get your auto marks back in the next 48 hours. It's just, I'm hoping we get it out tonight. That's my aim. And I am prob probably think we will. Because um, we want you to get them back at a reasonable time. So, should be fun. Okay, so 9.1. Today, lots of fun, fluffy stuff. Um, software complexity. I actually really like this topic. Um, I'm not going to lie, there's one or two topics we teach that I don't love that much. I won't tell you what it is, but um, this is one I like because I think it actually, uh, particularly the start, funnily enough, the fluffy parts of this are actually the most interesting. So we're talking about software complexity, and this falls into the bucket of software design, designing software. So first question, how complicated is software? Right? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If you had your project and your tutor looked at you and was like, how complicated is your code? You maybe have an answer for it, but how do you how do you have a formal answer for it? You know, how do you actually like you can't just say yes or no, um, right? Um, like it is a lot because like what does that even mean? So um, we're going to talk about software complexity, and <coughs> questions around it are um, how do we make our software less complex? Right? I mean, no one wants complex software. You have to be like a psychopath to want complex software, right? Like unnecessarily complex software. Um, complex software is harder to write, it's harder to maintain, it's harder for other people to understand it, blah, blah, blah. It's more likely to be buggy. Um, so we don't like complex software. Now, there's no easy way to just like make software simple, right? Like you know this from experience. You can't just like lint your code and then it like, you know, makes everything um, like non-complex. So, the two categories we're going to talk about complexity in are <coughs> essential and accidental complexity. And I think these are terms you can actually carry into your own life as a software engineer. So, the first one is essential complexity. Um, it's complexity that is inherent to the problem. You can't change it. It's not, it's not about how you have implemented it. It's about just how um, complex the problem is. And an example of that is if someone comes along to you and it says, hey... Um, <coughs> your backend is really complex. It's got like, it's got like a couple dozen routes in it. You know, like, wouldn't it be simpler if like, you just had a few routes? And it's like, no, it wouldn't, because it can't be, because that's essential complexity. That's complexity that we can't change about this. Right? Accidental complexity, on the other hand, is complexity that's not inherent to the problem. Is in the problem does not cause that complexity to ha to have to exist. Um, you know, and, and one of the most simple examples of accidental complexity is writing your own stuff. Because when there's a library that exists, writing your own stuff, writing a JSON parser to parse JSON for you, or writing your own web server in C, or um, uh, what's another example you might have all done in your project? Writing your own random number generator when you have all these other libraries. <laughs> You have all these other libraries that exist, um, you know, and and that's that's the interesting question to ask yourself, you know. So when when you read someone else's code, when you write your own code, and it is complex, because some things are just complex, right? It's not about removing complexity; it's about removing accidental complexity or unnecessary complexity, um, <coughs> and and yeah, uh, that's what we want to get rid of. Uh, Tay has asked: Is one five three one an accidental or essential complexity? Um, I don't know, you tell me. You tell me in a year, or well, now, I don't know. <coughs> uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, obviously we like to think it's all essential. Um, the thing about essential complexity is you can't really remove it. Um, 
but you can mitigate against it, right? Um, a really simple example that, um, you know, we're pretty happy to kind of mention now is like, and I'm sure some of you have noticed is that um, there's a lot to do with channels, right? In the spec, leaving a channel, getting the channels, creating a channel, sending a message in channels, adding someone to a channel, all of that. Um, then there's a whole bunch of stuff on DMs, right? Direct messages. You got to create a DM, remove a DM, invite someone to a DM, potentially leave a DM, get the messages for DM. Um, now, essential complexity is the fact that there's all these different routes that you have to implement. Your code's going to be so long, it's going to be so complex. But you like to use good software engineering practices to, to use Tay's term, mitigate the essential complexity um, of, uh, you know, some of this stuff. An example, what do we know about software design? We don't like repeating ourselves, right? Dry, don't repeat yourself. So one simple thing you can do, for instance, in your project, if you haven't already, to um, manage the complexity with good software design is to abstract a lot of your DMs and your channels under similar code, right? Um, is to like totally abstract that out, right? Because like direct messages and channels are functionally very similar things. So you could reuse a lot of code. Um, you could possibly abstract those two things under the same kind of set of functions, for instance. And that's how you could use good software principles like keeping it simple, don't repeat yourself, etc., cetera, um, to actually, you know, make that complexity as uncomplex as it can be but you still can't do too much about it because of the fact that it's essential complexity. Um, accidental complexity, you can pretty much totally remove with, um, well, it's hard to remove entirely. That's a bit contradictory, isn't it? Um, you can mostly easily remove that, right? You don't have to be too smart about it. Um, you know, like you, you can use libraries, you can use other things. Um, you can reduce it dramatically with not much effort. You don't have to be too hard because it, it's just stuff you don't really do, right? Um, great, okay. So are there any processes for, any formal processes for ac like distinguishing between accidental and essential complexity than just fighting? Um, how much of your code is complex? How much of your complex code is accidental? Um, and how much accidental code can we, accidental complex, accidentally complex code can we remove in future? These are all really interesting questions that you should always feel empowered to talk to people about because <coughs> one of the problems is like when you make a merge request, whether it's in 1531 or other courses, you should always be dubious of complex code. And I can't express this to you enough. It's like, I, if there's one thing I've learned managing a fairly substantial production code base in the last... 24 months um, complex code is like rarely worth it like complex code is it's it's plagued it has disease it, it breaks more than it fixes um, and <coughs> sometimes when I take a pause I'm trying not to cough um, and sometimes the the reality of that is you have to have these hard conversations with people like group members and stuff it's like hey this looks really like confusing you know, I, like, it, does it need to be this crazy? Like, I we feel like it was something simple, and they're going to come back and say, no, it needs to be this complex, right? Because, like, that's how a lot of people think, right? You write complex code, and you think it needs to be complex. You don't want... Most people don't want to write complex code. Um, and then you have to have that conversation, and you have to talk about it. You have to be like, well, you know, can we do this any other way? Like, no. And that's where that whole, is this essential or is this accidental comes into it. Um, you can read on this stuff again, none of you will, but like there's some stuff that makes me feel better knowing that I've given you things you won't read. Um, measuring complexity though. So measuring complexity is not really the topic around distinguishing um, accidental from essential. It's really just about what is complexity, like how complex is code, whether it's accidental or essential, whatever. Um, and, yeah, so 
you can, um, like one way you can measure code, right, is if you, say you have a, a bunch of functions or a bunch of files, might be another way of doing it. You could draw out all your files that exist, like you could be like, all right, well, here's my, um, here's my channels file and here's my um, messages file and here's my DMs file and or like however you structure your code, right? Maybe these are files, maybe these are functions, maybe these are classes and you can actually draw dependency links between them, right? So like if you import anything from messages inside of channels, then you know, channels depends on messages. And if messages import things from DMs, then message depends on DMs. And you can actually write out all your code like this to understand what we call, you know, like coupling or cohesion. It's like um, how, how tightly linked is all your code, right? Because good software design is to try and have things as separated as possible, right? I think we all get that. So that's one way you can try and analyze complexity is actually just trying to map out your code and understand all the relationships between the components. And the more lines you have, the more complex it generally is, right? So we generally would like loose code, as in code that like is not too tightly connected. Um, and we've already talked about coupling cohesion, so I'm just giving you like a quick summary of that, which is like we would like code <coughs> to be limited in how coupled it is, because coupled code is non-rigid code. Okay, um, cyclomatic complexity, we'll get into this now, um, it's a little bit of a fun topic. Before we do, I'm just going to take a very quick pause for a couple of forum questions. Um, so first one, like Miguel and your issues, it's like, um, so gen generally say someone says, um, okay, we've had a member in our group lie to us about the progress they were making. Right, so best thing to do, which I know you probably know, is like same as always. It's like if they've lied about it, well, document that and pass it on to the tutor. Right, um, again, the quicker you get stuff to tutors, generally the better the outcome you get to deal with is. Um, and then Yuval says, uh, due to using simple JSON format for data, your front end makes API requests way too fast sometimes and throws an error on front end while our back end algo is still running. I don't fully understand. That'll have to be a forum question. I have no idea why. Like, like the way front ends work is they make a request to a server and they'll be very patient. Um, like, they, like I make a request to your backend. I'll sit there for often like five or 10 seconds just waiting to get a response. Even if the backend's like shut down or is like looping infinitely, like it'll wait a little while. So there's probably something going on there that, you know, we just need to see a bit more information about and then we can, then we can be helpful. Um, okay, so cyclomatic complexity. What this topic is, is how do we actually measure branching complexity of code? Um, <coughs> so, what is branching complexity? Well, um, if you write out code like this, branching complexity is basically any time you do an if statement, an else statement, or a loop. And the theory behind cyclomatic complexity and looking at branching is that if you look at some, I mean, let's go find some code together, right? maybe some complex code. Um, I don't know, there's probably a weather solution we can look at. Um, yeah, so like this is an example of some code, right? Now if you look at this, <coughs> the thing is where code tends to fail, and you know this from experience, where the big logic errors and behavioral errors come about, is it's not because I had six lines of code here, or seven or eight, right? It's not often about how much code exists in a linear flow. Where most code breaks is in branching, when it makes decisions, when it goes in a loop, or it goes left or right, or something else like that. Um, so when you look at a piece of code like this, the danger areas are the for loop, the if statement, the if statement, the if statements here, 
um, stuff like that. So what cyclomatic complexity does is it is a measure of the branching complexity of functions. So it looks at a function like this and it has a higher complexity for that function if there are more branching factors in it. right? Because a function that's 100 lines long, that's just statement after statement, no for loops, no ifs, no elses, is probably pretty simple. It's a bit long, but like it's, it's unlikely to break, right? Because complexity tends to have a correlation to things not working. Um, it's computed by counting the number of linearly independent paths through a function. Linearly independent is a big word that is basically just describing um, it doesn't care about things in a line, like all these code executed one after another. It cares about all the different ways you can go, right? Because if you think about code, like code with for loops and if statements is just a big adventure game, right? Like you start, you go through these two lines always, and then you decide, will I go through this or will I go through that? Am I going to go left or am I going to go right? If you enter it, you go one way and you go down that path until you get a for loop. And then you say, am I going to start entering this loop or am I going to skip this loop, right? Like it's a series of de decision points. And um, when we say like linearly independent flows, it's like, there are all these different possibilities of how you could navigate through a program, right? And all these different possibilities come about because you have for loops and because you have if statements. They don't exist randomly, they exist because of those things. So again, if you had a hundred line function with just no loops, nothing in it, just lines, um, then there's only one flow through it. Start, you go to the end. There's no ifs and else and fors and stuff, so <coughs> that would be a very non-complex function. Okay, what's the formula we're going to use um, to figure out cyclomatic complexity of code? Um, it is this, the cyclomatic complexity is the number of edges in the code represented as a graph minus the number of nodes in the code represented as a graph plus two. Now what do we mean by that? Like that's really random to look at like a math formula with code. And the idea here is that we should be able to reduce every program to a graph that's a series of nodes and edges. So this example here, <coughs> notice here, and let's, let's like, um, we, could, we might actually try and draw this, right? Um, so you have a piece of code. Oh no. You have a piece of code like this, right? Now, if you were to draw this, Think about what the decision points you have are. Right? You, no matter what, are always going to execute A because you're always going to check it, right? You're always going to do A in the if statement. It's going to return true or false, but you're always going to do A. And then you have, then from A, you can either go to B and C. But you can't go to both, right? That's how if else statements work. From A, I can either go to B or I can go to C. And then no matter whether I do B or C, I'm always going to end up back at D because I execute D regardless. So that's why when we draw this one out, it's a beautiful A. Can't wait to screw up the others. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Got that one so right. Okay. Perfect. Um... Right, again, because we start at the A and we're going to have to do that anyway. And then we can either go to B or C. And then for B or C, we're going to have to end up at D anyway. Right, you see how we can describe the flow of that program that way? Um, <laughs> so it's so sad. I should change the, uh, the course, course image to just this, just this picture of the B struggling to, to live. It's on life support. Um, this is the program, right? I hope this makes sense, right? Now, for more complex programs, it's harder to turn it into a graph. But for simple ones, we're always going to do the A, and then we decide B or C, and then we're going to end up at the D. To calculate the cyclomatic complexity, well, we have to figure out E, and we have to figure out N. Now, remember, E is the number of edges. What are edges in this kind of structure? Edges are really easy. It's how many lines do exist? Well, we know because we drew them. There's one line here. There's two lines here. There's three lines here. There's four lines there, right? So in this case, E is 4. Then we have n, which is the number of nodes. 
right? We got one here, one here, one here, one here. That's four nodes. Okay, so the cyclomatic complexity in this case, which we know is like uh, e minus n plus two, is four minus four plus two, which is two. So the cyclomatic complexity of that graph is two, of this code is two. The lower the number, the better. The higher the number, the, the more complex it is. Um, and generally, right, I think two is like nearly as low as you can get it. Maybe one, I don't know. But um, yeah, generally two is like a good number because it kind of implies that you don't have like a bunch of unnecessary branching. Um, so let me move on. We got another piece of code. Let's not look at the graph. Let's ignore the graph. Let's try and do this one ourselves. I might even get it wrong. Okay, we've got this here. Now what do we know about this? We know that we're always going to have to do A first. Oh man, I'm so good at A's. Not really, that one was half bad. Um, and we know if we do A, we're either going to do one of two things. We're either going to go into this bucket here, or we're going to go into this bucket here. Right, so if we go into the first bucket, uh, okay, we do a B, and if we go into the second bucket, we're always going to do the C. No matter whether you enter that if, or you don't enter that if, you're always going to do the C. But in the second bucket, we're either going to skip the D or do the D, right? So you do that one there. And then we can start actually drawing... Oh, God. We can, I might just draw some, like, circles on these things. Oh, what a terrible program. Okay. Right, so like these are the ways we can go from A to B, we can go from A to C, and then from C we can either go to D or we can skip D. But you notice all of these flows again end back up at E. So if we go into the first if, we go to B, and then we finish with E, um, and then C again can either go to D and end up at E anyway, or it can skip D and go to E that way. Yep, <laughs> great. Um, now what's the cyclomatic complexity of this? Well again, it's E minus, well let's start off. E is what, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. So E is six. Um, N, one, two, three, four, five, N is five. And then our cyclomatic complexity of E minus N plus two is six minus five plus two, which is three. Right, so it's slightly more complex, <coughs> this code. In terms of like, um, in terms of the branching factor, right? So this code has a more complex branching flow. Um, and again, a higher number generally, <coughs> generally is something you want to avoid. How many more we got? Three. Well, we can do or two. Same thing. Wait, is it the same? No, they're different. Okay, let's go through the last three quickly. Okay, so what do we do with loops? Well, what do we know about loops? We're always going to have to execute that A first. Right? Because, like, whether we enter that while loop or we don't, we're always going to execute that A. And we know we're always going to finish <coughs> with a C. Okay? Now what happens with the A, though? After we process the A, we can either enter the while loop or we can skip it. So if we skip the while loop like this, that's fine. And if we enter the while loop we're going to execute B. Now, what happens here once we execute B? Well, we execute A again, right? So what loops look like in these kind of graph representations are something like this. Because we get caught in the AB loop and then eventually we're gonna leave. So again, what do we have here? We have E, the number of edges, which in this case is three because there's three lines on this graph, and then n is 3 because we have 3 nodes on this graph, right? So 3 circles, n, 3 lines, that, and then same thing here, c equals e, uh, n minus e plus 2, c equals 3 minus 3 plus 2, 3 equals 2. Okay, so that one's 2. Okay, this one, this one gets a little bit more kooky, but let's, um, let's give it a go. Maybe this will be the last one we do. Okay, bit of a, bit of a complex piece of code here. Now, this one is kind of a more interesting one because the previous pieces of code that we gave were all A's and B's and really simple stuff. Whereas this one is a lot 
more like a real piece of code you'd actually read. So we might actually have to label these things. <coughs> so I'm going to I'm going to label the first I'm going to label this line here um, to be A. Right, this while loop. Maybe I'll make it blue or something. I don't know. Bam. Um, and then I'm going to put this return down here as I'm just going to call it Z, just because it's easier. And then we know we're going to start with a A, and we know we're going to finish with a Z, and everything's going to end, uh, end up back there. Now from the A, we can do one of two things. We can either come in to this while loop, or we can leave it. Now when we come into this while loop, we're always going to execute this line here. So I'm going to call that one B. So I'll draw B here. So we know we're going to come into that. Now what do we know once we come into that? From here, we're either going to come in and do like another if statement inside of that, or alternatively, we're going to end up um, in this else block here, like that. So from B, we might end up in C, or we might end up with D. Okay, now what happens with D? What happens when we're done with D? D goes back to A, right? Because we finish this else statement and we go back up to the while loop. Like that. And what happens with C? Well, either with C we enter this if statement, E, or we don't, right? Like if we enter this if statement with E, then we, we go inside of it, otherwise we don't. So I'm going to put E here. So C either goes inside that or it skips it. And when it skips it, it goes back up to A. And when it doesn't skip it, it goes to E, and then E goes back up to A anyway. And then eventually when A is done, it goes to Z. Now that's a terrible graph. It's a much better drawn one here. But let's see if they actually like compare to each other. Um, okay, so we have an A that we start oh, sorry, we have an A that we start off with, which goes to B. Yeah, B branches to C and D. Perfect. C branches to E, perfect, and then C, D, and E all go back to A, and then A goes to Z. So we look like we've got the graph right. Now the other thing you'll notice is, remember, these are independ linearly independent <coughs> linearly independent flows. Um, and one thing that's really good about drawing cyclomatic complexity is that <coughs> we don't care the fact that there's two lines here. That doesn't make it more complex. <coughs> we don't care that there's a year up the top of this function. That doesn't make it more complex because there's no extra branching there. And it's funny because if you actually add unnecessary nodes and edges to your graph, as long as you do it correctly, it doesn't change your answer. So I'll give you an example here. I'll show you this, e to f. So now what we're gonna do is instead of e going straight back to a, we're gonna say, well, you know what? Once we execute this line here, it actually goes to f, which is another node like that. And then when F is done, it goes back to A. And then A goes to Z. Now, the reason that this doesn't do anything is because this redundant thing we've added is exactly one node and one edge. And if you think about the formula, N minus E plus two, if you add one node and you add one edge, they like cancel each other out. So we could actually do the cyclomatic complexity on this. We could say E is equal to, well, we got, you know, one, two, uh, I'll just mark them. We got, we got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so we have nine, and then n is equal to um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great. So c equals um, n minus n minus e. Have I been doing that wrong? Oopsie. E minus n, <laughs> sorry. Um, e minus, or maybe I was doing it right, I don't know. E minus n plus two. So in this case, c is um, nine minus seven plus two. So c is four, which should be consistent with what we get here, four. That's the process you follow. You might get asked to do this in an exam. You might uh, <coughs> not get asked to do this in an exam. Um, it's a good thing worth knowing. Um, Some people argue 10 should be the maximum cyclomatic complexity of a function, where others argue for 8. So what's interesting about this is you could actually 
use this as a standard for determining the complexity of your functions. And if your functions are too complex, you might just get told to break them up. So that's kind of where this would, would actually pan out, as you can kind of mathematically determine the branching complexity of your work um, to something reducible to a number. Um, downsides, it assumes that non-branching statements have no complexity, um, which isn't always true, right? Like, you know this from your own experience. There are some lines of code that actually have a lot of complexity in them, or there are linear things that can be very complex, like a series of parsing strings or decoding JWTs or, or stuff like this can be very complex. Um, but this kind of branching complexity does not take that into account. Um, and then there's also some other fancy things out there that, I mean, you, you don't really need to care about, but um, PyLint can also check cyclomatic complexity too and other things if you want to. It's it's a static thing as well, like it's a static check. So unlike tests, which are runtime checks where you actually need to run tests, um, this is a static analysis thing that you could do. Like you just need the source code, just like PyLint. PyLint doesn't need to run your code, it just needs to look at your code. And cyclomatic complexity is the same. Okay, that's pretty much it on this topic. Um, so I'll get a poll up, but are there any other questions on this? Okay, here's the poll for um, complexity.